Dear guests, students, colleagues, welcome to the honorary lecture by the University of London Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Andrian Smith. Our guest is a well known scientist in the field of mathematics and statistics. Together with international recognition as an academic, Professor Smith has gained international recognition as a leader of several UK universities. He also worked in UK government. In 2011, he was knighted by Queen for his achievement. In 2012, he became as a vice chancellor of University of London. Today he will give a honorary lecture focusing on the recent developments and challenges in higher education over the world. Let me give a floor. Welcome. First, can I say hello to everybody? It's a great pleasure to be here with one of our important international higher education partners here at ICF. What I want to uh, do, this is a, a timely point of history to say a few words about the changing field of higher education because across the world, I think in most, if not all, societies, there is an increasing sense of the importance of the role of higher education to the economy, to society, to individual aspirations. At the same time, as changes around the world, including, obviously, trends towards globalization, living in a, a global world where Countries aren't separate in a sense. They're connected in all sorts of ways economically. Uh, there are big um, issues of mass migration. There are changes to the climate and so on. And in all those areas, as I try and say, in some sense, higher education has important vital roles to play. So higher education is important. Sharing international thoughts and experiences is very important. So I think we, we have an hour, and I don't want to speak for an hour. What I will do is try to leave sort of half the time so that we can have uh, a discussion, if you like, a debate. I, I am not a world expert in telling the whole world how to run higher education. Uh, but I'm going to do something like the following. I'm going to sort of tell a story about the evolution of higher education within the UK, and then draw some commentary out of that as to the issues that are more global than what has happened in the UK, but perhaps the UK experience may be relevant. So I think I gave an abstract where there are key kind of questions that we should ask ourselves. Of course, you're embarked on higher education yourselves, so it's the last question you would want to ask, but you know, maybe if you pay your taxes and you don't go to university, you might say, what, what are universities for? Why do we have them? So I think we should be prepared to answer that question. And if we, how do we answer it? Is it about adva ad advantage for individuals? Is it a private matter? like your life will be improved because you go to university? Or is it a public matter that we need what comes out of universities in order to create wealth, in order to keep the population healthy, in order to build infrastructure? Is it one, the other, is it both? And depending on the answer, who should pay? Should the state pay for your education or should you pay for your education? These are questions that are asked around the world and we should be prepared to answer them. So even if we've got to the point that universities should exist and somebody's paying, 
What should they teach? What should they tell you? Why should they tell you anything? Why don't you just Google Wikipedia and know everything about the world? So who should be in charge of what knowledge we try and communicate and disseminate? Um, who owns it? Is, it? is it the state? Is it professions? Do lawyers own legal education? Do economists own economic education? Those are questions we might ask. And higher education isn't the only form of education. The, the state has to provide for small children, for primary schools, for secondary schools, for technical education, for vocational education. All education is important. So is higher education more important than the rest? If you have a finite sum of money, how would you divide it between small children and you? And if we are really living in a, in a global kind of world, how much of the educational process, how much of the content should have an eye on the fact that we live in a global world? Uh, so how, what's the balance between education that's relevant locally, regionally, nationally, or enabling you to survive in an international context? And here we all are sitting in a lecture room. Do we need lecture rooms? I could be in London, and I could put this on a video, and I needn't have spent all this money traveling here on an airplane. Is there something special about sitting in a room together? Why don't we just do it all by technology? You can all sit in your bedrooms and access Wikipedia, access me on Skype. Why do we need these buildings, expensive buildings? Why do we need rectors? You could decide for yourself what you want to learn, put it together. So all those questions, I think, are out there in the world. The use of technology, does technology change the world? Does it change uh, the way we regard higher education? So I'm going to look at those kind of issues, but I'm going to start um, really with the evolution of higher education within the UK. We sort of take for granted the, the, the structures we have at the moment. So for example, in the UK, there are something like 164 institutions that have the power to award degrees. So I want to just briefly, because I have to hold the flag up for the University of London, I want to take you back to 1836 in the UK. If you go back a little bit further than that, wasn't Napoleon advancing on Moscow at the time? So not far from the time when Napoleon was advancing on Moscow, in the UK, in England, there were just two universities. They're quite well known, Oxford and Cambridge. But they were only for men, and they were only for men who had a certain religion, the Anglican religion. So part of the revolution that the University of London was part of in the UK was the single word, access. A long time ago, very few people had access to higher education. And so what we've been involved in in our history is opening up access. So from 1936, uh, we were able to give degrees, give education, to people who were not, at the moment it's only men, wait for it, only men, but irrespective of religion. Then as we move forward to 1878, so we have a big anniversary coming up next year, 140th anniversary, one of the first universities in the world to open higher education to women, which we're very proud of and we're going to be celebrating all year. So we passed the thing of, you didn't have to be a certain religion, your gender wasn't important, and then it became a matter of place. Because the University of London, of course, was in London. So we had Oxford, Cambridge, and London, but what if you lived in other UK cities? Birmingham, Manchester, Birmingham. And so the big revolution came for us in 1858, when the Queen at the time, who's Queen Victoria, gave us a charter which basically said, hey, you can give University of London degrees to people if they can pass the exams. They don't have to come to London. And so lots of local centers opened up 
which provided the kind of tutorial and other education that enabled people to sit for the University of London examinations. So for a period, the University of London, outside Oxford and Cambridge, gave complete access and educated the whole of the UK, the whole of England. Now, of course, the centers that supported students in Manchester and Birmingham are now famous universities in their own right. But we are the grandparents of all the universities, basically, in England. And the other thing that happened was that a civil servant on the island of Mauritius, and if any of you ever get the chance to go to the island of Mauritius, it's a fabulous place. He read the charter, and he noticed that Queen Victoria had forgotten to say that we could give degrees to anybody. If they, she forgot to say England. So actually, legally, you could sit for University of London exams anywhere in the world. And so Mauritius, in 1865, was the first place to enter students for University of London degrees. So since 1865, and we celebrated the 150th anniversary of that two years ago, we've actually be opened the access to working with the University of London around the world. And now we have 51,000 students in 180 countries, uh, 800 here in, in Russia, and many, many partners around the world, including uh, ISAF, our, our big partner here in Moscow. So the higher education is never static. It evolves in all sorts of ways. But the key evolution that I want to just emphasize for the moment, and the University of London was part of, is that word access the openness to the higher education for whoever can benefit from it to anyone, regardless of gender, race, religion. And you should bear in mind that that is a recent revolutionary thing. In the past, in some senses, the universities were like priesthoods, priestly castes, small groups of, of people. OK, so that's part of the background of the evolution of higher education in the UK. What I now want to do is bearing, using what happens in the UK, but generalizing issues. And at the end of the day, I'm going to come back to that set of questions that I posed at the beginning, and you're going to give me the answers. So what are universities for? Well, the origins of University of London, of many other universities, was actually teaching. It was imparting knowledge. Somebody has knowledge, and they give it to others. And a lot of that at the beginning uh, was really to do with the professions. The medieval universities would have faculties of theology, training priests, faculties of law, training lawyers, faculties of medicine, training doctors. So th in some senses, the medieval universities were very vocational, very practical. They trained the mind, but they also trained people to work. But it was to do with teaching, to do with imparting knowledge. And then there was a big revolution, essentially, in Germany in the 19th century with Humboldt and Humboldt University, which saw universities as engines of something other than just giving knowledge, but a revolutionary thought creating knowledge. In other words, research. So in addition to teaching, universities have evolved into machines for doing research. And that will lead us to other questions. OK, that's fine, but who sets the research questions? Are they set by a, an individual being curious? Or should they be set by the person who says you, say, pays your salary, or by the state, or whatever? So anyway, teaching and now research. And in addition to research, the revolution really in Germany was the word science. I think in German, science covers all knowledge, but certainly physical sciences, biological sciences, in the universities of the past, these weren't on the agenda. It would be classics, it would be religion, it would be law, it would be medicine. And so the opening up of universities as engines for scientific discovery and work is, again, a fairly recent thing in the last 100 or so years. Now, in many countries, there was a distinction between the 
kind of creation of new knowledge and the imparting of existing knowledge. Many countries then had a divide between what many would call polytechnics and some would call universities. So the idea is that universities were about education and creative thought and polytechnics were about training and learning to a profession. In the UK, since the war of the 1940s, in the 1950s, 1960s, um, we have expanded the system, taken on board the research element, but today we decided that all the polytechnics became universities, so everybody teaches, everybody aspires to do research, and all are expected to contribute to the economy and to society. So I went to university in 1965, and 5% of my age cohort went to university at that time. The current figure in the UK is 42%. So in addition, we go back to that word access, not only did we remove gender, race, religion, uh, and opened it up, but now we've opened up volume. So almost half the population goes to study in universities. So what I want to do now is come back to some of those questions in a sense about who pays and what's it for. So in the UK, let me deal with research and innovation first. We have a structure of research councils. We have bodies that try to pull research through into wealth creation. And we reward universities for the past quality of their research. And all higher education can join in. There's a large sum of money available. And it's a competition. It's a competition to prove that you are better at future research or past research to get the money. And the state provides that money. So in the UK, almost um, all the money going into universities, not all, industry also sometimes buys the services of universities. But essentially, the state purchases research. And so you have a, a question, really, as to um, who defines the problems, who defines who gets the money. So we have a complicated system of assessing research, um, almost like marking your homework. So you mark the homework of researchers in the UK in every university, you add it up, and then you decide how much each university shall get. And it's not just the quality of research, but the state has decided that it wants impact from the research that it buys. It still allows, basically, academic researchers mostly to define the questions they research, but it then wants them to prove that the questions that they asked led to some societal or economic impact. So you could debate uh, whether you like that or not. So what could impact mean? It could be the discovery of new drugs. It could be mathematical algorithms for running manufacturing processes. It could be environmental improvement. It could be educational initiatives, cultural improvement, anything. But at the end of the day, the state is saying there ought to be some return to society for the money that it spends on people like you and on research. Is that dangerous? Is that the only way we can do it? Uh, so obviously, once you've got taxpayers' money buying a service from others, it becomes political because people then have to debate how much of the national wealth do you want to spend on research and innovation versus spending it on health, on schools, on roads, whatever. So um, it, at the moment in the UK, we have a situation where the government thinks that research and innovation is very important, and it actually has given increasing money in that area. What about teaching students? Well, until the last 20 years, the government just gave money to the universities for them to provide teaching. So the government covered um, teaching costs. It gave different amounts to university. Medicine is more expensive to teach than history, so it was divided up in that way. If the government decided it didn't have enough, so much money for universities, then universities cut the number of students going to universities. So universities were at the whim of 
national finances and national uh, politics. In recent years, we have shifted from that system of giving the money to universities to giving the money to students. Except we don't give the money to students, we loan the money to students. So uh, this issue of, of students, students are now charged fees, quite large fees, to go to UK universities, but that money that they need for the fees, they can borrow from a national loan company, and then they basically pay it back as additional tax. If you get a job that pays you a lot of money, you pay back the loan. If you had a job that doesn't pay you very much money, you don't pay back the loan. So that's the system we've evolved to. And now that becomes, again, a very political question. If, higher ed if we're charging the students to get educated, that kind of suggests that we're seeing ed higher education as a private good rather than a public good. And that also, people are worried that charging fees to students will disincentivize the poor. So as soon as you get into those questions, it enters the realm of politics and the debate. So in the UK, I don't know uh, across higher education in most of the rest of the world, but because there is so much public money either going into research or into supporting loans, that at every election, every political debate, higher education is a topic that's discussed almost daily or weekly in the newspapers. So that puts the higher education system in a very interesting spotlight. So if students are taking out loans that they have to repay, students in a way become customers or consumers. And as with buying other objects in a shop, customers and consumers have rights. They want to know that the quality of what they buy is good. So we are in the middle now in the UK for the first time of government taking regulatory powers to assess the quality of teaching of students in higher education. So this is very interesting because you might debate later, how do you measure the quality of teaching? If you have 200 people in a room, it's very unlikely they will all think the same about the lecturer. If the lecturer goes too slowly, all the, all the students who, who are on top of the subject will be fed up because they're bored. If he goes too fast, all the ones who are struggling to understand will not understand. So it's very hard to give a lecture, like now, where you would make 200 people happy. So what, what, what is the quality of teaching? What is the quality of education? How do you measure it? Uh, so we're in the middle of that kind of debate uh, at the moment. What about what you teach at university? Who decides on the content? Historically, if you go into a lecture, what you'll be taught in the lecture has been decided uh, you know, by the department, by the head of the department, by the lecturer, in other words, by academics. But if we are spending huge amounts of government money on research, for example, can we simply say that individual academics, or you, if you're doing so, some research, decide on what the problems are? What if nobody works on the problems that society really wants answered? So what is tending to happen, and it's happened across the EU, and in particular based on models in the UK, there is a funding thing, it's called Horizon 2020, which actually offers research money under three different headings. One is what you might call pure research, just curious thoughts, deep thoughts, maybe about mathematical structures or about how the banking system ought to be reorganized or whatever, whatever. And then there's another strand which says there are needs in business and industry that need solving. So some academics should be working with business and industry. And then the third strand is that society has problems across the world living with climate change, the effects of climate change, living with the effects of aging, dementia, 
increasing numbers of people living to be very old but having to be cared for needs a lot of national wealth. The fact that antibiotics are becoming more and more, uh, there's more and more resistance to antibiotics. Food and water supply linked to climate change add cybersecurity. All those kind of issues any government probably thinks, if it's spending a lot of money on academics, on students, and on research, that, that some effort ought to be going in to solving those problems. So the conclusion from all this, really, UK experience but internationally, is there's a complex interaction between the funding of higher education, who funds it, and what they fund it for. And what proportion of the funding, in a sense, should be spent on pure academic improvement of the mind, improving the knowledge base, and what percentage should be spent on utilizing knowledge and solving society's problems. And there is no kind of right answer to this, and so it's a constant matter of debate, which is why I think it's important that the, the whole generation of modern students actually think a bit more broadly than, I know it's, you know, you have to get your head down and you have to do your assignments and you have to pass the exams, but be aware of this big wider world in which in most countries, students in higher education are still a minority, even maybe 50% in some countries, but the majority are not getting this experience, but it's their taxes that are paying for it. What sort of rights or what rights the government on behalf of society should have in influencing, prodding, organizing higher education? These, these are quite deep and serious kind of issues because, at least in the UK historically, um, we have always used phrases like academic freedom. It's very important that clever people have the freedom to explore whatever they want to explore. But of course, somebody is paying for it. And as soon as you have that pay relationship, somebody is going to question what happens. The other major thing that's happened in all this space of research and teaching is international mobility. So this is a difficult time for somebody like me coming from the UK when we're rewriting our whole historical landscape of our international relationships within Europe. But historically, uh, the UK has been, again back to access, has been very open to international students and international academic staff and the movement of people between countries. So many higher education institutions in the UK currently have, it's not untypical, that 30% of the students are international from the EU or more broadly. And these are not displacing UK students because um, they're, they're not in competition for, for places. Um, the UK universities have no cap on how many UK students they can, they can take. And in many departments of academic staff, you have similar figures, 30% of the academic staff internationally. Now, we have always regarded that as a, po a big positive in that all the, all the problems that I described just now, climate change, aging, antibiotic resistance, food war, they're global international problems. And so solving those problems, doing the research, contributing to the thought processes to solve those problems, the more international it is, our assumption has always been that that's right. However, there is a climate for all sorts of reasons, but within Europe, uh, the mass migrations as a result of, of, of what's happened in Syria and Iraq and North Africa and so on, where there is a, a climate in the public that perhaps migration and mobility is not such a good idea. And that is legitimate as public debate, but actually it could be very threatening to the university systems that we've built in Europe which have been very much based on mobility. So, almost finally, I don't want to go on too long, who decides on what's taught in universities? So, given that we have faculties of law, we teach physics and mathematics and engineering and medicine, 
At least in part, this has an eye on the workforce and social needs. We need lawyers, we need doctors, and so on and so forth. However, the world out there is changing quite dramatically in terms of what you might call the big data information revolution, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, or whatever. And a recent study in the UK concluded that roughly 70% of children in primary school, when they get to the workforce, the nature of the jobs and the description of the jobs that they will do have not yet been invented. So the pace of change of what the workforce will consist of and what skills are required in the workforce are changing dramatically faster than any educational establishment changes its curriculum. I had a colleague in a maths department in 1980s who I saw on his way to lectures and the folder said, complex analysis, 1951. So he hadn't changed his lecture notes for 30 years. I think there are very few subjects, including the ones that you're studying, where you could say that, that somebody will be able to pick up their lecture notes and re-give them in 30 years' time. The whole world is changing dramatically. So how do we ensure a linkage between the relevance and the interest of what we, we, what we teach and what we research in universities to the wider society where these revolutions are going on around us. And part of that revolution, of course, is, is technology. So an average 15-year-old in the UK, I guess here, has an iPhone in their left hand, an iPad in their right hand, and is wearing earphones. So they live in an e-world. I don't know what it's like here in this particular building, but I can tell you up and down the length of the UK, there are very, very limited use of educational technology in universities. We in the University of London, of course, are ahead of the game because with our distance reach out around the world, we're very much into the use of technology. We work with the Coursera platform in Stanford to create these massive on open online courses, MOOCs, where we've had, we have about 1.2 million um, loggers in, regulars. But this is transforming the world, and it poses a challenge for higher education. Uh, it poses a challenge for the workforce. Roughly speaking, any job that is to do with pushing around pieces of paper or searching among pieces of paper, and that includes a huge amount of what goes on with lawyers, you're looking for past case histories and the rest of it, within 10 years, all that can be automated. So there's going to be a huge hollowing out of jobs and professions that we currently have. And given that the university is funded by society to create high-level input to the workforce, uh, we really have problems. So there's a challenge for the future in terms of what we teach and who decides what we teach and, you know, are there eternal truths, or does the, the truths of the world change every five years? And then the pattern of education. I, I, I don't know what the average age in the room would be, but I, I would be pretty sure the average age in this room somewhere lies between 18 and 23, despite a few um, outliers that add to the total. So is, is, and that's the way that a lot of higher education has been defined. You go off at 18 and you spend three years or four years or five years. And you've got something and that takes you through life. If what I say is true about the changing nature of the world around you, no, no knowledge acquired between 18 and 23 will be sufficient or even relevant in 10 years' time. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the problem of lifetime learning. Uh, you know, the state is putting all this resource into 18 to 23 year olds. Is that the right thing to do? That's another radical challenge, I think, to all of us. So I just, I won't go on much longer. Just let me see this in, in the context then of, of global patterns. There are shifting global uh, demographics. Um, apart from as, as 
life expectancy rises and general affluence rises, fertility rates decrease. You wouldn't be surprised by that. And so the combination of all this is going to lead to a decline in the youth population in most of the world. Africa's the only region where that's not happening. So within society, the balance of aging, fewer young people, more old people, half of them with dementia, changes totally the landscape and puts different pressures on higher education, partly in terms of demand from the young, partly in terms of the research and delivery for the old. Uh, countries will fight for the best talent. What does that have to say about migration and, and mobility uh, in terms of attracting students? Um, official policies in um, Australia, Canada, and China are to vastly increase the number of international students coming into those countries. And this is determined by wanting the brightest and the best from around the world. All countries have this problem over division of national funding. And maybe if you think of aging, just think of one thing, think of aging, aging population, more and more people living longer, requiring much more expensive health care. There is not an infinite growth to national wealth, national economies. So there are major political decisions to be had. If we're not just going to let the old and the mad die in the street, we're going to spend more on health care for old people. That means there's less of national wealth available for young people. How do we divvy that up between higher education, you could look after yourselves in some ways, and young children who can't? Uh, how will I relationships with industry vary? Increasingly, we have multinational companies. They can move their base from country to country. One of the major determinants of where they go is high-level skills. If you're locating, I mean, we, we at the moment still have major finance industry uh, in the UK, in London. If we stopped producing people of the right caliber, or we stopped allowing the brightest and the best from around the world to migrate to London, that, those financial institutions will move somewhere else. And so national governments are not the total power brokers. Major international corporates have power as well. Demand for skills, I've already mentioned the changing nature of the workforce. Uh, students as consumers, uh, if you are hoping to get good jobs as a result of your university experience, then you will care a lot that the university is offering you courses and teaching you things that will be relevant to getting big jobs. So there are all these forces, individual students, industry, the world around us, which are exerting pressure on universities to which universities have to respond. And I think I will stop there, but just to remind you of the original questions, in this changing world, uh, students as consumers, multi multinational companies able to move and dictate to national governments where they put their money, what is the role of higher education in all this? Is it for private improvement of the mind? Is it for ensuring that there is a, a decent economy? Is it for ensuring that uh, mad old people are cared for? And how do we decide how much of that is private or public? Who should pay for what? And what should we teach and how? Do we use technology appropriately? Um, how should we react to all this? I haven't the faintest idea what the answers are, which is why I'm going to stop now, and you're going to tell me. Thank you very much for a very interesting, thought-provoking lecture. And now we'll open the floor for comments and uh, questions. If you would like to ask a question, please raise hand, and uh, you will pass your microphone. But uh, not forget, please, to uh, introduce yourself. Maxim Nikitin Isev. So I have two. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the very interesting talk. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, what is your perspective on the 
charging uh, on the making tuition fees contingent on educational background and uh, basically should better students pay more or less. Okay? And uh, the second question concerns um, uh, okay, weaker universities. Okay, there are stronger universities, weaker universities, top level schools, low level schools. Should low level schools survive in the era of online education? Maybe it's better to get online education from a top school than a offline education, traditional education from a fourth tier university. Okay, thank you. <laughs> two, <laughs> two nice, easy questions to start with. <laughs> Let me, let me start with the strong versus the weak. If you take, um, just take my own uh, su subject area, mathematics, there are, you know, if you ask mathematicians around the world, they will tell you the six or eight universities in the UK that are in the Premier League of mathematics. If you look at the pipeline of who form those departments, who enter them as PhD students and the rest of it, they are not all homegrown because the volume of those six would not sustain, okay? So the best analogy would be football. If you only had the Premier League, there would be nowhere for people to learn the football skills to become part of the Premier League. So it is essential that when you have a pyramid with excellence at the top, you don't have that excellence unless you have something below that pyramid. So then it's, a, then it's a judgment question of how you best have the second division and the third division. Do you need a fourth division? But you cannot just, you cannot just have excellence. It's fed by other things. Fee on fees. Um, I, I don't know which way around you were saying. Do we, um, do we waive the fees for the brightest or do we waive the fees for the poorest? They might not be the same thing. Um, in, in the UK, we haven't entered that territory, really. We've um, just said everybody can take the loan. And if they have a successful career, they will pay some back. If they do something in the UK, nurses are not very well paid. So actually, you could train as a nurse. And for the first few years, you wouldn't be repaying the loan because you don't pass the, the threshold. But um, I think. Given the history of the University of London, my instincts are everything we can do to maximize access and opportunity is good. And we might think we're inventing clever mechanisms to distribute, but they may have unforeseen consequences of putting people off. But you, big point, you can't have a Premier League without some other football leagues. of statistics of University of Wales an active professor of statistics of this university. And I, I'm interested whether you have any sympathy for statistics as a subject, or you are advised all subjects are the same for you. And if you do, uh, how you will cope with the facts that some British universities are closing down uh, statistical and actuarial degree schemes. Do you still uh, local fluctuations, or you, you see some tendency here? Thank you. Okay, so this, this is almost a private question to me, uh, given my background as a mathematical statistician, my attitude to statistics. So back off the word statistics, which may or may not sound exciting. I think it's very thrilling, but there you go. The world is full of uncertainty, and we try and reduce that uncertainty by acquiring evidence. And if we can acquire quantitative evidence and turn it into some assessment of our probabilities about the things we don't know, this is an essential part of life. So statistics is utterly fundamental, not just to statisticians, but in all disciplines. Um, I think the challenge is, the challenge is not to statistics, you know, the use of data to, to learn and to improve decision making. The challenge is to statisticians. The challenge is, could you automate all this? Could you develop computer algorithms which are just as good, or if not better, than human beings at processing data? And this is the real issue that's going on in the transformation of the workforce. The use of algorithms to, to manipulate data, the use of robots to manipulate things, is transforming the world. 
And outside of data and ideas and things, there isn't much yet left except to get old and mad. So. Yes. Um, uh, Professor, thank you very much for an excellent uh, presentation. My name is Andrei Markov, and I am a guest here. I am coming from Moscow State University. I appreciate the invitation to be here. I have a question to you about the ratings, university ratings. And I would appreciate if you could talk a bit about uh, ratings as a measurement instrument as a, as a researcher, as a scientist, and also talk about ratings as a university administrator, because these are two different perspectives. Thank you very much. OK. So <clears throat> as I said in my talk, for quite a long time now in, in the UK, and I think in, in many other parts of the world, if we take research first, um, we have tried to rate and create league tables and rankings by actually agreeing on what we could measure. Since the primary output, first output from research is you have to write a paper which your peers will accept and referee and put in a journal, we have an objective measure of what you did. Did it lead to new knowledge that journals around the world would accept as adding significantly to knowledge. So there's an objective measure. Um, on that basis, if everybody agrees there's an objective measure, you can measure people and form a league table. And I think in the research field, to be honest, in the UK, most people, whether they're in universities or outside universities, regard those rankings on research as pretty accurate, as objective measures of where the big contributions are. When you get into something like teaching, I think you're in a much more difficult territory. Uh, many, many classes in many universities will have a mixture of people. Some are doing courses because they have to as part of the degree. They're not very interested. Some will be doing the courses because that's their big passion in life. It's very hard to think that they will all have a uniform view of teaching quality. And, and, and what does it mean? You know, am I a good teacher if I speak loudly? Am I a good teacher if I tell jokes? Am I a good teacher if my PowerPoint is flashier than some other guys? Uh, what does it mean? Um, at the, you might only know I was a good teacher in 10 years' time. There may be a huge time lag in what you've learned, and you look back and you think, hey, that was the guy that taught me what I really wanted to know. So I really do think there are problems with rankings in teaching. Now, when you start ranking universities around the world, what are you going to do? You're going to take one column that relates to research, another column that relates to teaching, another column that relates to the quality of the students who enter, another column that relates to the qualifications of the teachers. And now what you've got to do, you've got a difficult mathematical problem. How much weight do you put on each of these? Do you put more weight on research? Do you put more weight on teaching? Do you put more weight on the sports facilities? There are a number of US state universities that come top of leagues because they have the best football teams. So ranking on individual measures, if you can do them, I'm very happy with. Combining measures across incommensurate, incompatible things seems to me a silly thing to do. Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. That was very enlightening. Svetlana Vlasenko, High School of Economics. I would uh, very much appreciate if you could uh, expand on the question of uh, employability. On the one hand, you said that uh, students are getting increasingly demanding in terms of educational services because they borrow monies mm -hmm. which they need to pay back sooner or later. Uh, on the other hand, you're saying that we live in a, uh, let me quote, transforming world. We don't know what, what's going to happen what's going to be happening in uh, two, three years yeah. from now. So what's the relevance of this uh, employability? Is it practicable 
Is it feasible, actually? And uh, uh, given that the majority of staff, the majority of teaching profession, uh, got their education some three or four decades ago, uh, none of them actually uh, wanted to get uh, another education. Actually, that, the, the skills got in, uh, in the educational establishment were pretty enough. Uh, and you mentioned 1965 as your enrollment year, so your skills can be said to <laughs> have been played well, sustainable enough uh, for you not to go anywhere else for education. So, what's the? Can you expand on the employability? Yeah. Thank you. Not, not, not only were my skills more than 50 years ago, but I'm about to enter the mad and the old bit as well. So this is really terrible. So you've you've picked up on something I was trying to pose to you. These are really conflicting issues. Um, we do not know what narrow base of skills you might need in 10 years' time. In my view, that reasserts the importance of universities to educate rather than to train. So I think, for the most part, we need to resist the pressures for short-term skills acquisition to a much wider thing. And, and of course, um, that could be contentious because, as I say, if society is funding the universities, they want to return. And they want to return within a shorter term than might be sensible. So I think this is a huge dilemma. There are colleagues of mine who think this is a reason for going back to a divide between polytechnics and universities. And that maybe more money, let's call it the polytechnic sector for a moment, more money maybe should go into that for training and apprenticeships and technical and vocational. But, uh, the university should be looking at the longer term set of issues. Um, this is not, you know, there is no mass movement in the UK to do this or think about it, but I think most people have not realized the exact dilemma that you're posing. Uh, no, uh, Alexis Belianin, uh, ISF High School of Economics, I have a couple of different questions. One is pertinent to the topic of your lecture, another to your to you as a statistician. Uh, the first one uh, would be uh, that universities nowadays are, of course, very heterogeneous institutions. Some of them may be, may be believed to contribute more to practical uh, knowledge and skills like natural sciences or uh, material sciences, engineering, mm -hmm. which produce material objects and henceforth are visibly valuable for the society. Other uh, schools or, or, or departments produce knowledge which is of moral values or uh, attitudes or shape preferences or raise important social questions like in social science or in humanities. Do you think that funding of these two activities should be uh, the same? Or, uh, or perhaps should society treat them differently? Maybe solicit more private funding, for instance, for the humanities rather than for the natural science and, and, or vice versa, or anything else about that. And the second question is on uh, statistics, namely the discussion raised recently in uh, top journals like Nature, uh, there are very visible voices that to fight the verifiability crisis, the proposals were to raise the p-value significance to 0, uh, 0, 0, 0,005 from 0, 0,5, 0, 0, 0,05. So what do you think of this proposal? Would it, of course, of course, the idea is that it comes from the fact that falsifiability of uh, many empirical works in social sciences, psychology, economics turns out to okay. be insignificant, to, insufficient to fight the false yeah. positives. Thank you. So, so for many, many in the audience, the statistical question may be a bit um, esoteric, but there is um, a very embedded set of statistical techniques which are called significance tests. You do some study and you say, is the effect significant? And the problem in statistics is the word significant doesn't mean what you think it would mean, that does it make any practical difference? It's actually an arcane mathematical calculation. So I've spent most of my life telling people not to do significance tests. You test for effectiveness and practicality, uh, not for some arcane mathematical jiggery-pokery. So that's that one. Science versus the humanities is a constant kind of uh, theme and debate. Um, <coughs> it's often posed in terms that you posed it. Physical science and material science is useful. Uh, the humanities aren't so useful. I think that's entirely wrong. 
All the problems I talked about earlier, living with environmental change, dealing with aging and dementia, they, they have enormous sort of societal, behavioral, cultural aspects to them. You, you won't solve these things by pure technical means. I mean, a lot of them are intrinsically behavioral. And to understand behavior, you need the social sciences and the humanities. So my fight back would be the humanities are incredibly important. How much money do you need to spend on them? Well, not as much as the sciences, because they're cheaper. But spend the right amount of money. But the humanities and the social sciences are incredibly important. Finish our lecture, but before it, I would like to give a small souvenir. From now, you are under ICF umbrella. Don't worry, be careful. Be happy. So I have to tell you a story that um, when it rained earlier, Sergei and his colleagues accused my colleagues and I of bringing this weather from London. <laughs> I have to tell you, the world has changed. The sun always shines all day in London. <laughs> I will use this to keep the sun off me. Thank you very much.